Okay, everyone, I think we will get started. So good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming to the very first in our What Matters to Me and Why series. My name is Marianne Hunt and I'm the Director mm -hmm. of Lifelong Learning and Travel in the Office of Alumni Engagement. What Matters to Me and Why is a series of virtual presentations followed by discussion that goes beyond the great research we've all heard about to give our community a chance to get to know our faculty, how they came to their topics, and in their own words, what inspires and is important to them. But before I produce, before I introduce Professor Mike Levin, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. You'll notice your audio and video has been turned off to eliminate any distraction and disruption from background noise. We'll have an audience Q&A session after the presentation. And if you would like to ask a question, please do so using the Q&A function on the lower right portion of your screen. This webinar is going to be recorded and will be <clears throat> uploaded to the Tufts Alumni YouTube channel. My colleague Amy will post the link to that page in the chat feature now. So please check it out for this recording and for our other faculty and alumni presentations. You'll notice the closed captioning is on. If you'd like to turn this feature off, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and click on hide subtitles. Lastly, I'd like to call attention to our community values. Our goal is to create an environment where everybody feels welcome to ask questions and participate in respectful conversation. Amy is gonna post those values now. Now I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Michael Levin, the Vannevar Bush Distinguished Professor of Biology and Director of the Allen Discovery Center. Michael Levin is an alum himself, having received dual degrees in computer science and biology from Tufts in 1992 followed by a PhD from Harvard University, and he did his postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School. He started his lab at the Forsyth Institute at Harvard Dental School in 2000, and then moved the group to Tufts in 2009. His lab is interested in diverse intelligence, the understanding, understanding the origin and mechanisms of cognition in natural and unconventional embodiments. Using a range of computational and biophysics approaches, they work to understand how cells and evolved and synthetic organisms work together to solve problems, such as making and repairing a complex anatomy. They developed the first tools to study bioelectric signaling within all body tissues that serves as a medium for the collective intelligence of cell groups. Applications of their work span birth defects, regenerative medicine, cancer, bioengineering, and artificial intelligence. I'm so grateful he's agreed to kick off this series. His research is truly groundbreaking as, and as I'm sure you're about to see, very exciting. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Michael Levin. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to uh, share uh, some thoughts with you and in particular, um, what really matters to me and why. And we're going to talk about um, something we call uh, unconventional intelligence. And uh, if you want to learn more, uh, please feel free to contact me at, uh, at, at these uh, websites. We, each of us feels internally like a single centralized intelligence. You have memories that underlie your personal identity. You have, uh, you have goals that are your goals, not the goals of your various parts. Um, you have preferences and, and so on. But remarkably, uh, we are all made of parts. In fact, we are uh, collectives of cells, such, such as uh, neural cells that you see here and many other cell types. And inside of each of, each of these are lots more um, parts you can see here all the amazing richness uh, that goes on and all of these little little molecular machines that are doing various things. So we are all, all, all of our, our intelligence, our embodied cognition is uh, basically created by numerous parts working together. And this is a, uh, a fundamental mystery of uh, science and philosophy, uh, the understanding how it is that competent, tiny parts work together to give rise to emergent selves with with uh, memories with preferences with first person perspective is not only really critical for philosophy of mind understanding personal identity sentience consciousness things like that but also they have very practical implications as i'll show you today uh, with dealing with uh, injury aging cancer birth defects all kinds of aspects of uh, biomedicine really hang on this question of how it is that 
parts make large scale decisions. This is partly why this is something that really matters deeply to me because it's not only uh, philosophical questions that are, I think, f fascinating and kind of at the root of what it means to be uh, sentient human, but also they have practical implications for making life uh, better for, for everyone. And in addition to, uh, to these fundamental and biomedical applications, as you will see, there are also some really important uh, aspects of ethics that are impacted by our scientific understanding of this, having to do with our understanding of various categories, things like words like human, robot, organism, and so on. I've been asked to talk a little bit about um, uh, how I got into all of this, and my earliest memories uh, are basically these, that um, I, was a, I was a kid uh, in, uh, in, in the old uh, USSR, I was born in 69, and in the early 70s, I had, I had asthma, and in the, in the absence of proper medication, pretty much the only thing left to do was to try to calm uh, the child down uh, so as to uh, not, uh, you know, not exacerbate the, um, the restriction of the airways. And so we had this, we had this ancient television that uh, had various, uh, various TV shows that I like to watch. There weren't that many, but, but this was one. But um, actually much more interesting than the front of the TV was the back of the TV. And what my, uh, my dad used to do is to take off the back so that I could sit there and stare at these, uh, at these components. And this was, this was to me uh, just incredibly fascinating because it was very clear that someone knew how to put all those things together in exactly the right uh, organization, right, to make uh, to make the shows come out the front. So, so it was very clear that what this device did was somehow a function of what was going on inside, and all these little parts had some uh, some um, a part to play in this uh, in this in this construction. So, how did they know to do this? At the same time, I was really into uh, bugs and insects, and here you can see. This is just an example. This is a video of, uh, of a, a bombardier beetle spraying down these ants, which are attacking him. Uh, he's going to spray them down with some hot acid that he actually generates uh, inside of his body. And, uh, you know, here you can see some, some behavior, such as this uh, crab, which seems to have a, a pretty good idea of what this, uh, what this implement is for that he's holding. And uh, this here is uh, our more recent work. This is a slime mold. This yellow organism is called a Physarum polycephalum. And uh, what it knows how to do, it's, the whole thing is one cell, by the way, this is one giant cell. And what it knows how to do is how to reliably identify the direction in its environment where there are three discs of glass as opposed to one. It's actually doing a kind of sonar in the, um, in the medium to uh, figure out where the larger mass is. So what was really fascinating to me playing with uh, caterpillars and, and bugs and, and beetles and so on, is this, uh, this, this amazing idea that, that life is also made of parts. It's very clear that living things are, are made of uh, small components, but um, it was quite different because unlike the TV and the other uh, types of um, engineering devices that I had seen, all of these parts come together to form a larger scale being. These are, these are larger organisms that have preferences, they have behaviors, it's very clear they like certain things, they don't like other things. How does that happen? Okay, so, so, so where did intelligence uh, come from in life? Who arranged all the parts? How did they get arranged? And how do these parts scale up into a being? What does it mean to be a, uh, a sentient being having all these different uh, kind of shapes and, and living in the world? So th throughout uh, the, the, the world that we see, there, are, there is really a continuum of agency, all the way from very passive types of machines that uh, really, uh, you know, very mechanical, the only way you're going to change what they do is to uh, literally uh, rewire them, alter the hardware. And then you have uh, going all the way up, there's this massive ladder where you start to have some devices with goals, such as a thermostat, which can keep one very simple goal of keeping the temperature in a particular range. You have some biologicals that have preferences. They can be trained by rewards and punishments. And then, of course, you have some symbolic reasoning systems, such as humans, which can be impacted by actual reasons as opposed to uh, rewards or, or forces or, or rewiring. And the amazing thing is that uh, not only during evolution did, uh, did these kinds of uh, beings arise from, from simple matter, but actually in our lifetime, each one of us has made this amazing journey from a single cell, in fact, from a collection of chemicals here, from a collection of um, uh, biochemis biochemical networks, all the way through to one of these creatures. In our case, here's a, a picture of Rene Descartes. Uh, we all made the journey from a single cell, which you might say is physics and chemistry, to a human, which has uh, profoundly advanced uh, cognitions, um, 
uh, metacog in fact metacognition self uh, self uh, self modeling and, and and so on so how did this happen how do we uh, how do we become uh, what, what Descartes called the Cartesian cut how do we get from this from this um, uh, example of physics and chemistry to a rational being now let's think about uh, this the, our, our origins here as individual cells this is an organism known as a lacrimaria this is a single cell there's no brain there's no nervous system uh, there's no cell to cell communication or stem cells just one cell and this cell is highly competent at solving all of its local single cell level problems in other words uh, physiological metabolic uh, morpho morphological it achieves all these little goals at the at the single cell level but the amazing thing is that during evolution these individual cells learned to work together to pursue very large scale goals. And here's an example. This is a uh, Mexican salamander known as an axolotl. These animals regenerate throughout their lifetime. They regenerate their limbs, their eyes, their jaws, uh, their ovaries, portions of the, of the heart and the brain. And the way it works is this, if you have a limb and they bite each other's legs off all the time, and, and if one of these uh, salamanders loses a limb, these cells will grow very, very rapidly. They recreate exactly what's missing. So whether it loses it up here or here or here, whatever it's lost, it only recreates exactly what's needed. And at that point, uh, it, it stops. And, and so, so these cells are able to detect this kind of error, right? When something goes wrong and they're able to reduce that error and then they stop. When do they stop? When a correct salamander arm has been produced. So much like a thermostat, but in a much more complex way, this is a system that can uh, pursue these very large scale anatomical goals of having a correct body organ. In fact, it's even bigger than single organs. Um, if you, uh, there's a very old experiment. If you take a tail from a salamander and uh, surgically attach it to the flank, over time, it will actually remodel into a limb because the whole body is able to determine that this is not the correct location for a tail. And even the cells up here, which are locally correct, they start to turn into fingers. The whole thing starts to remodel into a limb. Now, uh, the champions of that kind of process are these little critters, which we use in our lab nowadays. This is, these are called planaria. They have um, a true brain, uh, central nerve cords, uh, lots of organs, um, all the same neurotransmitters that you and I have. And the amazing thing about planaria is that they are incredibly highly regenerative. So you can chop it up into pieces. Uh, the record I think is around 275 pieces. Uh, every piece is, uh, will, will give rise to exactly what's missing, no more, no less. And then you have a perfect tiny little worms. Not only uh, are they highly regenerative because of this, they're also immortal. They've solved the, the question of aging. There is no such thing as an old planarian. They basically can, they can live forever. Now, regeneration is not just for so-called lower animals. So the human liver, of course, can regenerate. Even the ancient Greeks knew that. I have no idea how they knew that, but they did. Uh, deer, which is a large adult mammal, can regenerate its uh, antlers every year, up to a centimeter and a half of new bone growth per day. And then human children can regenerate their fingertips below a certain age. But of course, we'd all like to be like the planaria, able to regenerate everything. And the amazing thing about these kind of um, repair and remodeling of the body is that not just the body changes, but also minds can change. And so here's an example of a, uh, of a caterpillar. This is a soft bodied creature that needs to crawl around and chew plants, but it has to turn into this. Uh, it's a hard bodied animal that has to fly and drink nectar. And so during, and, and those require very different brains. And so during this transition here, uh, basically the brain is pretty much liquefied. Most of the connections between the neurons are broken. Many of the cells die. A brand new brain is reassembled. But the amazing thing is that uh, the memories remain. And this has been shown that if you train the caterpillar on particular tasks, the butterfly or the moth actually still remembers. So if you've taken philosophy 101 and you've been asked to imagine what's it like to be another creature, you know, what's it like to be a caterpillar, uh, you can take that one step further and ask actually, what's it like to be a creature changing slowly when the brain is actually changing into a completely different type of creature with different uh, capacities, different sense organs, some of your memories will remain, but, but, but uh, your, your mind and your body will change drastically. So, so we really need to uh, understand that this, is a, that, that this process can occur not just through evolution, but actually on the scale of a single organism. Um, another example is this, in these planaria, if you train a planarian on something and you cut off their heads, the tail will sit there for, uh, for about a week and then they start to regrow a new head and once they regrow this new brain, the rest of the body somehow imprints the memories onto it. And then you can, you can check them for memory and then, then they have, you can tell that they still have memory. So this requires us to try to understand how, is the, how, how are memories, how, are, how is cognitive content 
stored in the physical medium of the body. It's clearly not just in the brain. How do these memories move throughout the body? These are the things that, uh, that, 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 that keep me up at night. Now, if you, lest you think that this is just some bizarre capacity of these, of these worms, you know, in our lifetime, we are going to have technologies where uh, human patients have portions of their brain replaced with new stem cells for degenerative uh, disease and so on. And what's going to happen to the memories of a, uh, of a patient with decades of, of personality and memories and so on when parts of the brain are actually regenerated or repaired with various technologies? This remains to be, um, to be examined. Now, uh, let's, let's get back to this uh, idea. Now, have, having looked at how, how, um, how memory and behavior and changes of the body interact, let's just think about uh, intelligence again. Um, William James had this fantastic definition of intelligence, and he said, intelligence is the ability to get to the same ends by different means or by various means. And I'm going to show you um, what, what this means in a very different, a different context than typical behavior. Here's a tadpole, and you can see the, these are the eyes, this is the brain, you've got some nostrils here, this is the gut, and these tadpoles need to become frogs. When uh, tadpole, in order to become frogs, all the organs have to move. So the, the jaws have to move forward, the eyes have to come forward, everything has to move. And it was thought that before, it was thought that this is somehow a hardwired, that every organ moves in the right direction, the right amount, and you get your normal frog from a normal tadpole. So we did an experiment to test this, and we wanted to understand how, how smart is the collective intelligence of these cells that know how to get from this shape to this shape. But what else can they do? And we created what's what we call Picasso tadpoles. These are tadpoles where everything starts out in the wrong configuration. So here you can see the eyes on the back of the head, the jaws are off to the side, everything is, has been scrambled. And you would think that if all of these organs just move the right amount in the right uh, direction, you're going to get a very, uh, very messed up frog. Actually, that's not what happens at all. Uh, all of these components move in novel, unnatural paths to get to, and they keep moving. In fact, sometimes they go too far and they have to double back until they get a correct frog face. So what the genetics actually gives you is uh, a system that is able to do some sort of error minimization. It can recognize that it's starting off in a different state, but that's okay. It'll keep remodeling in the right direction and stop when it gets there. And so what you can see here is that these cells actually have in a very uh, kind of a basal um, cybernetic sense, they have a goal. They have the goal to get to the shape and they can pursue that goal through different paths. This is, uh, this is that story again of the same ends by different means. Now, the scale of your goals says something very important about your cognitive uh, sophistication. If, if the biggest thing uh, that can serve as your goal is sort of local, let's say local metabolic state on a single cell level, you're probably a single cell or a bacterium or something like that. But you could work together with other cells and pursue very large goals, like this giant uh, goal of having a limb, way bigger, no individual cell knows what a limb is or how to count fingers but the cellular collective does. And so that's how evolution got us from these uh, very humble single cell goals to much larger anatomical goals and eventually behavioral goals that you and I um, can pursue. But uh, this process can actually go awry. And this is where the medical issues come up because individual cells in this collective can defect and they can uh, disconnect, as it turns out, I'm gonna tell you in a minute, electrically disconnect from the other, the other tissues and their goals shrink right back down to the goals of a single cell. They basically revert back to uh, the, the, um, the behavior of our ancient ancestors, let's say an amoeba. Uh, the goals of an amoeba are to become two amoebas and to go wherever life is good, and that is cancer. It's metastasis. When cells uh, stop working towards normal, uh, building normal organs and tissues and go off on their own, they basically just treat the rest of the body as outside environment. They're not more selfish than any other cell, it's just that, than any other um, structure, it's just that their selves have gotten much smaller, okay, and now they're pursuing that. So, this, so the boundary between self and world can grow and shrink during these processes. Now, this is a very uh, kind of unusual way to think about developmental biology, but, uh, but, but actually, um, Alan Turing, who's one of my heroes, very interesting, he's of course known as uh, the, one of the forefathers of, of computer science, and he was very interested in computing and intelligence and, and so on. But um, uh, he also wrote a paper on, on morphogenesis, on, uh, on, on developmental uh, patterning. And why is it that somebody would be interested in both of these things simultaneously? And I think, I think he was onto something very important. Cognition and morphogenesis are really the same problem. They're a problem of the working out of intelligence in two different spaces, okay? In, in the space of um, anatomical structure versus uh, the space of uh, behavior or other things that we normally associate with intelligence. Um, and so, so let's ask that question. How do tissues know what size and shape to be? So this is, um, 
a, uh, this is a cross section through a human torso. So look at this, look at this incredible order, all the tissues, the organs, everything is in exactly the right place, the right size, the shape, organization next to each other. Just amazing. Where does it come from? Because we all start life like this. These are all uh, embryonic blastomeres that have to work together to build this exact thing every single time. Um, where is this pattern specified? Now, you may be tempted to say DNA. And uh, the important thing about that is that we can read genomes now. And we know that when you, read, when you read DNA, you read the genome, you don't see anything about the shape or size or symmetry or structure of the final organism. What you see is a description of the uh, cell level molecular hardware. You see all the little proteins that every cell gets to have. But you still have this amazing question of now having had that hardware, how is every cell going to uh, con communicate, cooperate, and compete with each other to make something like this? What's the software? Okay. So how do the groups of cells know what to make and when to stop? Um, as workers in regenerative medicine, if something is missing, we'd like to know how to convince these cells to rebuild. And as engineers, we actually also want to go further and say, well, what else can we build? Instead of this, with the same genome, what are these cells willing to build if we were to um, communicate with them? So I've shown you that the collective intelligence of groups of cells has anatomical goals. And the question, one of the questions you might ask about that is, how do they know what those goals are? How does the system, how does a collective intelligence represent its goals? How does it keep track of its goals? And in order to answer this in my lab, we took some inspiration from the brain because that's, of course, a, uh, a basic uh, system that, that we, we know there's a collection of, of, of cells inside each of us that's able to carry out all kinds of goals. And so um, that's our inspiration. The way it works in the brain is basically this. The hardware consists of uh, various cells that have ion channels in their membrane. These are little proteins that can um, shuttle charged molecules back and forth. So potassium, uh, sodium, chloride, things like that. And as a result of these going in and out, there's a voltage gradient, like a little battery across the surface, and that can be communicated to other cells through these little connections, these little uh, synapses or linkages known as gap junctions. So you've got this whole network where individual cells in the network can have different voltages, and they all communicate with each other to pass the information back and forth. That's the hardware. The software you're seeing here, this is a zebrafish, a living zebrafish embryo. It's been imaged. This is not our video. That's another group that uh, was able to image this uh, and see the electrical activity of these cells as the zebrafish is thinking about whatever it is that um, zebrafish think about. So you can see all, all, all of this electrical activity encodes all of the, the cognitive content, the memories, the, the, the sensory inputs, the, uh, the goals, everything of this, of this animal. And the amazing thing is that this trick, the, this ability to have uh, a cognitive software that rides on this, on this kind of hardware is in fact not uh, something that just uh, uh, came along when neurons evolved. It's been here all along. It's evolutionarily ancient from about the time of bacterial biofilms. So all cells in your body have the ability to drive electrical uh, states. Most of them connect and communicate with each other electrically. And much like we saw what was going on in this brain, here you can start to look. This is an early frog embryo, and we've treated it with a special uh, chemical that fluoresces different um, different signals depending on the electrical environment and you can see all of these cells having their conversations with each other about who's going to be left who's going to be right uh who dorsal ventral how many eyes all, all these sorts of things so i want to show you so so basically what what we've been doing is we've been learning to read and write the 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 the, the simple mind that exists in these uh, cellular collective intelligences. And so, you, and, and the way you can read and write it is by um, reading and writing the electrical states. So the pre-patterns, the electrical pre-patterns look like this. This is an early frog embryo in a time-lapse, um, putting its face together. And you can see here that uh, this, is, this is one frame out of this movie, that if you track the, the bioelectrics, you can already see what's going to happen. Here's where the eye is going to go. Here's where the mouth is going to go. Here where the placodes are going to be formed. You can already read long before the genes get turned on to actually uh, start to pattern a frog face. You can already see the memories of uh, the future here, okay, of, of what's going to happen. So this is a normal pattern that is absolutely required for normal craniofacial development. If you manipulate this electrical pattern, uh, we get those um, Picasso tadpoles that I showed you, also various human channelopathies, the birth defects in this electric face uh, arise that way. There's also, there are also pathological patterns. Here is uh, a tumor induced by a human oncogene, uh, but long before this tumor arises and starts to metastasize, you can already see the bioelectrical state of these cells as they've basically disconnected 
from their neighbors and acquired a really weird depolarized state that leads to conversion and metastasis. So this is how we read the, the, the basically read the mind of these collective intelligences. We track much like um, neuroscientists do with neural decoding of the brain. We can track the electrical activity of all these other cells. Not only can we track them, but actually we can rewrite them. And the way we do it, we don't use applied. There are no electrodes. There are no electromagnetic waves or magnets or anything like that. We basically use uh, the same tools as neuroscientists do. Uh, we use pharmacology and gen genetics and light to control how cells uh, talk to each other and what kind of electrical uh, states they, um, they, they undergo. So basically we can, now, we can now write the kind of information that you just saw us uh, reading. When you do this, here's what, here's what, what you can do when, uh, when, you, when you've learned to do that. First thing is, um, here's an example. There's our, there's our uh, induced tumor with its weird uh, aberrant bioelectrical state. And we had said, what if we, what if we put in the oncogene, but at the same time, we put in a, something else, an ion channel, that forces those cells to stay electrically connected to their neighbors. In other words, even though the oncogene says disconnect and go become an amoeba, uh, we are going to force them to stay electrically connected to their neighbors. And when you do that, here's where uh, the red, the red, the the red is where the oncoprotein is. It's it's blazingly expressed. Here's where the tumor should be. It's in fact it's all over the place. But there's no tumor, and there's no tumor because we've managed the bioelectric. So even though the genetics say. Uh, go 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 uh, d detach and go do metastasis the bioelectric says you are part of this uh, this this collective that's making some nice skin and muscle and whatever else keep doing that and that is what that is what wins so there's an obvious kind of um uh, path here to uh, both both uh, diagnostics of cancer and to reprogramming not to kill it not not killing cancer cells like in chemotherapy but actually to reprogram them there is uh here's another here's another example i showed you a minute ago in that uh, in that electric face pattern, what it is that that kickstarts eye formation in the head. And uh, we had asked what happens if we simply kickstart that same bioelectrical state someplace else, let's say in the gut. So here's a tadpole, here's the eye, here's the brain, this is a side view, here's the mouth, uh, here's the gut. And so some of these gut cells, we've injected them with a specific ion channel RNA that changes their voltage. And it sets that voltage to the pattern that you saw that was normally associated with eyes. Once you do that, that is the reference that tells the local cells what they should be doing. Sure enough, as soon as that pattern is on, they make an eye. The eye has the same layers that you would expect, retina, lens, optic nerve. And one of the, um, one of the coolest things about it is that if you only um, manipulate a few of the cells, here are these blue cells. This, is, this whole thing is a lens sitting out in the tail of a tadpole somewhere. It's induced. The blue cells are the ones that we manipulated. They have an aberrant voltage that says make an eye. But what these cells seem to have realized is that there's not enough of them to make a proper eye. And so what they do is they recruit a bunch of their neighbors, which we never directly manipulated at all, and say, OK, we're all going to work together to build this lens. So there's two instruction events. We instruct these cells to make an eye, and these cells instruct their neighbors to participate in that formation. In fact, the coolest part about this for regenerative medicine purposes is that we don't know how to make an eye. We don't, we don't give it enough information to specify how to make an eye. This is like a subroutine call. If anybody's done any um, coding, uh, this is like uh, uh, calling a whole long module of things that the animal already knows how to make an eye. It's already done it during development. Um, what we found is a bioelectrical trigger. It's part of that electrical software that tells these cells what it is they should be building. So not only eyes, but you can make, uh, you can make extra brain and ask whether that makes you smarter. You can make uh, extra inner ear, so older cysts for balance. You can make extra hearts. You can see that here, beating hearts. You can make extra limbs. So we've got some nice five and six uh, legged frogs. Uh, or you can make fins. Now that's kind of odd. Uh, tadpoles aren't supposed to have fins. We'll get to that uh, momentarily, but you can see that by manipulating the bioelectrical pattern memories uh, that tell cells what to build, you can make all kinds of organs, not changing individual cell behavior like stem cell differentiation, but actually whole organs. Now here's a planarian. We cut the planarian in half. You get uh, this end is supposed to make a head. This end is supposed to make a tail. How does it know? Well, it turns out there's this voltage pattern that you can read. Here's the memory of these cells of what a normal planarian is supposed to look like. One head, one tail. And we can go in and we can manipulate that electrical pattern and say, no, actually a real, a good planarian should have two heads. And sure enough, that's what they build. This isn't Photoshop. These are real animals. Mm. So you can make two heads. In fact, you can make no heads and you can ask all kinds of interesting behavioral questions. What's it like to have two, two brains? But one of the most amazing things about this, and I keep calling it a memory why, because if you 
uh, if you uh, cut again this two-headed animal, so you, you cut off the primary head, you cut off the ectopic secondary head, you leave just this nice middle fragment, that will, in plain water with no more uh, manipulations of any kind, will continue to generate two-headed animals forever. So basically, uh, it's a memory because once you've changed the, the electrical pattern from, a single, from saying single head to saying two heads, that pattern holds, right? It holds until actually we know how to change it back. We could, we could change it back if we wanted to. So the question of what determines how many heads a planarian has is tricky. It's not just the DNA. The DNA creates um, um, a, a body that by default has a bioelectric pattern that says one head. That's not necessarily what it has to have. If you change it, it can have two. And that's completely invisible at the level of the genome. So I could go along and I could take one, uh, some of these two-headed worms. We're not going to do that, but you could uh, throw them in a river somewhere and they would uh, they reproduce by tearing themselves in half and then regenerating. And that still generates two-headed animals. Some scientists might come along 100 years later, take some samples and say, ooh, a single-headed form and a double-headed form. Let's sequence the genomes and see what the speciation event was. And of course, the genomes are completely identical. That's not where this information is. So we're starting to understand the importance of this physiological or bioelectrical software that sits between the genome and the actual anatomy, which is what we really care about. Now, in addition to, uh, to, to, to asking the tissue to grow a second head of this, of this correct type, you can go one step further and you can actually uh, take a planarian, let's say this one, this species with a nice triangular head like this. And if you manipulate the bioelectrics appropriately, you can get them to grow a head that's round, like an S. mediterranea, or flat, like P. felina. They can grow heads of other species with no genetic modification. There's no genome editing. There's no CRISPR. Purely by altering the bioelectrics, they can call up these, um, you can think of it as attractors in the space of all possible heads. There are shapes that belong to various species that evolution uses. And you can take this fragment and knock it into these various other attractors in addition to the one it normally uses. Not just the external shape of the head, but also the shape of the brain and the distribution of stem cells becomes just like these other species. And so we're taking now this ability to uh, really communicate to the tissue what it is that it should be building and using it for regenerative medicine. So here's an example. Frogs, unlike salamanders, do not um, regenerate their legs. And so 45 days later after amputation, there's nothing. We uh, came up with a cocktail that, of, of bioelectric um, modulator drugs that trigger these cells into a build whatever goes here state. Again, a trigger of a, 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 um, a subroutine trigger. And when you do this, the, the cells know perfectly well what goes there. It's a leg. They, they turn on uh, pro-regenerative genes such as MSX1. They start to grow these, uh, these toes. Here's a toenail. And eventually, so, right, so this is an early stage of that leg, but eventually that leg becomes uh, touch sensitive and motile. It's a very respectable looking normal leg. And the amazing thing is that um, the, uh, the, the treatment that we, uh, that we discovered, we only do this for one day, 24 hours. After that, you get a month and a half of leg growth month and a half of leg growth after after convincing the cells that they should be building a leg you don't need to intervene after that it's not a bottom-up micromanagement it's a top-down trigger communicating with that decision point of what are we going to do after injury and so i think that um the future of the future of biomedicine uh looks like this you know this is where this is where computer science was in the 40s and 50s where you had to program computers by physically rewiring them and then eventually it was, it was figured out that if the hardware is good enough and the biological hardware is definitely good enough, what you can do is you can program them by experiences. You can program them by stimuli. You don't need to rewire them to do something different. But, um, and and that's, what, that's what brought on the whole information technology uh, revolution for us. But as far as molecular biology and, bi and medicine, we are all still stuck at this stage. Everything, everything nowadays, all the excitement is about uh, genomic editing, um, uh, stem cells, uh, pathways, protein design. It's, everything is focused on the hardware. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface of biological software. And so the, bio, the, the medicine of the future is going to be much more about communicating with cellular collectives, uh, possibly training tissues, changing their uh, bioelectrically encoded anatomical memories, not trying to micromanage them from the bottom up. And so in the last couple of minutes, um, I want to uh, take this now beyond medicine into, uh, into synthetic biology and show you kind of a really wild uh, recent uh, project that we've been doing in the last couple of years. Um, one, one can ask the following question, uh, what, what do skin cells in your body know how to do, right? And so um, you, can, uh, you can imagine that, well, what's, what skin cells know how to do is they know how to have this really sort of boring two-dimensional life being the outer surface of 
uh, of, of the body, keeping out the bacteria and, and things like that. And so we asked this question, is that really um, all they know how to do? And so we, we took a, an early frog embryo, here it is. We let it develop for about eight hours. This is it in cross section. All of these cells up here at the top, these are what's going to be uh, what are going to be the skin cells. Okay, so they're already faded to be skin. And so we cut off these these cells and we put them in a dish to be by themselves. Basically, gave them a chance to reimagine their multicellularity. Now, one can ask, what will happen? There's a few possibilities. One thing is they might die. They might crawl off um, into the different corners of the dish. They might form a monolayer like cell culture. Uh, they might do nothing, um, all kinds of possibilities. In fact, this is what they do. When you put these cells into this little depression overnight, they coalesce together. They come together and they squeeze into this little ball. And um, the flashing you're seeing, by the way, is calcium signaling. It's uh, Even though there's no neurons here, this is exactly what, what brains do. They do this kind of um, in interesting computation with these, with these calcium signals. And one of the things that skin cells in the frog have is they have little hairs, little motile hairs called cilia. These hairs usually are spinning to keep the mucus flowing down the body of the frog and keep the pathogens from sticking. Well, when you do these, these little guys, and we call them xenobots because the name of the frog is uh, for Xenopus lavis, and you're about to find out why we call them um, xenobots because they make tiny little biobots or proto uh, proto organisms either way. And uh, what they what they do now is they use the little hairs to swim. They use it to row against the water. And here it is. You can see one moving. They have different types of movement. You, they go in circles. Some of them patrol back and forth like this. Uh, here's uh, some tracking data from a bunch of them. This one's going on kind of a long journey. These two are interacting with each other. These are just sitting still. All sorts of interesting motile behaviors. Again, keep in mind this is just skin. Okay. This is um, this is uh, this is just skin cells. Uh, using their molecular hardware, such as cilia and various other things, to organize a completely novel organism. Here is a xenobot in a, uh, in a, in a, a maze of uh, still water. So here it is, it's going along, it's going to take this corner without bumping into the opposite wall. And then here, for reasons known only to the xenobot, it decides to turn around and go back where it came from. Okay, so they have spontaneous behaviors. In fact, if they're damaged here, if they're, if they're cut almost in half, they will seal up to their new xenobot shape. Uh, as I said, they have these, this, this amazing, um, uh, these, these amazing uh, calcium events. Uh, we're still working to decode uh, if they're talking to each other and if so, what, um, what they're saying. Mm, they have another, uh, just to finish up, they have another amazing capability. One of the things that, we, that happens when you, um, when you make these, these xenobots, we don't add anything. There are no new genes. There are no uh, nanomaterials. We don't add anything, but we take away something. What we take away is the rest of the cells. The rest of the cells that normally tell these skin cells to have this really, uh, really simple two-dimensional passive life. And so what we're really finding out now is what it is that uh, the skin cells are really capable of. And, and normally in the context of the embryo, they're simply prevented from doing that. Well, one of the things we prevent them from doing is, is, is um, reproducing. So, so they can't reproduce in the normal froggy fashion because we, they're missing most of the tissues that you need to do that. Well, within, uh, within about uh, 48 hours, they figure out a new way of making copies of themselves. We call it kinematic replication. If you provide them with loose uh, 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 pieces of uh, other skin cells in the environment, here they are, the, the materials, basically, what they will do is they will run around, they will collect that material into little piles, okay, as you can, you can see here, they sort, of, they sort of make these little piles, and when the cells become these little piles, well, the cells become the next generation of xenobots, because that's exactly how these xenobots came to be, and so they are able to make copies of themselves, so far we've seen, uh, we've seen about four generations form, and uh, this is, uh, this, this is uh, basically von Neumann's dream, a machine that will go out and find parts in its environment and make a copy of itself. Okay? And, uh, and um, uh, they're, able to, they're able to, no other animal on Earth, on Earth does this, certainly for, there's nothing in the frog uh, line, developmental lineage that ever looks like this. So a single frog genome can give rise to frogs, sure, but that's not the only thing it knows how to do. It also, and maybe many other things, it knows how to make xenobots, has their own developmental sequence, in three months, the xenobots start to look like this. They have their own uh, different um, development and they have different, uh, different behaviors. And the thing about these guys is that unlike every other creature on earth, when you ask why is, why is a certain creature a certain color, why does it have certain shape capacities, the answer is always the same because for millions of years, its ancestors were selected to, to do this or that. Well, these have no evolutionary backstory. There's never been xenobots. There's never been selection to be a good xenobot. Why does this genome 
uh, know how to make a creature that has these uh, these very different capacities. And what are their cognitive capacities, for example? Can they learn? Do they have preferences? All of this, these are open questions. You know, how does evolution provide novelty? So I want to close with, with this. The last thing I want to say is this. What we are now seeing is uh, that uh, synthetic biology and bioengineering has, uh, is going to impact our world in a, in a very massive sense. Darwin had this, this, uh, this phrase, called, which he, he, he was looking out at a, at a riverbank and kind of impressed with a variety of life, called, and he called it uh, endless forms most beautiful. And what we're learning now is that biology has incredible ability to handle novelty. It's highly interoperable. Every combination of living material, so cells, tissues, some sort of designed machine, in, meaning, meaning a brain interface, computer brain interfaces, uh, robotics, whatever, and software combined together in some organization is a, is a possible viable uh, or a being that we are going to um, encounter in the next decades. We already have cyborgs, so humans with brain implants that let them drive wheelchairs and prosthetic limbs. We have hybrots, which are various kinds of brains driving robotic bodies. We have uh, synthetic animals. Um, the the uh, everything we know about all the creatures that we know about are just a tiny little uh, tiny little region of this incredible option space of possible beings of different construction which never existed on earth before and so what this means is that in the future and this is the impact on ethics that we must um think about really carefully in the future when you encounter a creature you will not be able to decide how to relate to it based on what it looks like you know, meaning whether it looks like some other animal or human that you've seen in the in the standard evolutionary tree of life, or where it came from, meaning whether it's naturally uh, evolved or designed and came off a factory somewhere. There will be so many novel combinations that these questions of whether something is really this or really that uh, will lose all meaning, and we will need novel categories of understanding the cognition, the mind, and the moral capacity of ourselves and of these beings to know how to relate to them because what they look like and where they came from are no longer going to be guides. So we need a deep, profound understanding of where minds come from, what determines the kind of mind that uh, a given creature has, and what relationship we can, we can have with them. And this, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, an incredibly exciting aspect of, of the biosciences going, going forward. It's going to affect everything, uh, the, the legal system, intellectual property system, um, everything is going to be affected by this. So um, just to close, I, will, uh, I want to thank uh, the various uh, postdocs and students who did uh, all the work that I showed you today, our collaborators, uh, all the animals we work with, which uh, really do all the heavy lifting here, um, our funders, and uh, to do a disclosure of a, uh, of a company called Morphoceuticals and another one called Fauna Systems that we've uh, spun off. So um, I will uh, just close by showing you a video. This is what the um, two-headed flatworms uh, look like when they're uh, sort of on their own. Uh, the first time I showed off these data, somebody at a conference, somebody stood up and said, that's impossible. Those animals can't exist. So, um, so I show a movie now. And uh, yeah, so thank you. I'll uh, take questions. Great. Thank, thanks, Mike. As usual, my mind is spinning and I don't myself know where to start, but fortunately we have people who have already started the questions for us. Um, so the first one um, is DNA then must store an initial body plan memory set as a default. So have we identified that in DNA code? And I, I, I think I'm understanding this to mean that without these interventions, our DNA still knows what to do, right? So, so, so the best way we know of uh, to think about this, so, so DNA definitely does not directly store anything that looks like the code for a body. So, so when you look at the genome, you, the, what, you, what you're seeing in there is the specification of the parts, proteins. You do not see um, actually, uh, you, you, you don't see actually any information about the large scale structure. So the best way to think about this is this. What the DNA provides is the specification of your hardware. So, so in the computer analogy, the DNA might be the things like, uh, here's the silicon, here's the copper, here's how they go together to make a transistor and all of that. Now, what, what, you, what the body actually ends up doing, meaning morphogenesis, physiology, and behavior, is the results of the software running on that hardware. And it's as difficult to tell what that's going to look like as it is to take a computer and try to figure out what it's doing based on readings of electromagnetic signals or taking an x-ray of the uh, of the copper that's in there getting the, the you know th those are all good pieces of information but it, it it they don't really tell you what's going on if you don't understand the software okay and so so you know the only thing you see in the dna is is a specification of the hardware all of the intelligence comes from that hardware exploiting the laws of physics and the laws of computation 
to self-organize. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Uh, there a question from from James. I recall evidence suggesting higher rates of cancer in kids who grew up near high power transmission lines. The mechanism was a mystery. Could this stuff be the explanation? Um, probably not. I mean, I I know that literature. It's there's a lot of uh, epidemiology around that. There there are other mechanisms by which applied electromagnetic fields can affect cell behavior. It's likely not this. These mechanisms mm -hmm. are very robust. Um, electromagnetics are not a great way to manipulate them. So that's probably not this. It's probably a related, uh, a, a different unrelated uh, set of controls. Okay. Um, th this is interesting from, from Alec about, are these xenobots a new form of life? I also would just add that I heard you using the terms cognition and intelligence not interchangeably actually so you know, i was i'd love to hear more of your thoughts about this like new form of life how how much can we attribute really in terms of it sounds like self-awareness but do we want to go that far i don't know yeah so so a couple of a couple of uh, questions there so are they a new form of life um they're definitely uh they're definitely a new form of organism so they're definitely a different proto-organism uh, they are not an entirely new form of life because we started with cells that already exist. So they're not make, we, we didn't make life from scratch. We took frog cells and asked the frog cells what they know how to make. So it's definitely new in the sense that it's not what that, um, uh, what, what those animals normally do. It's not anything that exists on earth other than this, but it's so, so, so that's, that's, that's that in terms of, um, in, intelligence and, and cognition. Nobody has claimed that these guys have self-awareness. Self-awareness is an incredibly advanced form of cognition. Uh, they definitely have, uh, as, as, as all cells do, they have uh, various, uh, various types of processes that underlie simple basal kinds of cognition. You know, very simple things, uh, sensing, response, uh, possibly memories. We actually don't know. We're still, we're still trying to figure out how smart they really are. We don't know. It's a spectrum, right? All the way from very simple things like thermostats and all the way up to humans and then beyond, right? So humans are probably not the, the top of this food chain eventually. So uh, we, we actually don't know where on that, uh, on that line they lie, but, but they have intelligence in the sense that intelligence is, is a problem solving capacity in any space. It doesn't have to be three dimensional space. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to be verbal, um, a language space. There are many different spaces, physiological. We could go on, we could, we could have a whole other conversation for an hour about other really amazing uh, ways that cells display intelligence, solving problems, metabolic problems, uh, anatomical problems, and so on. So, so they have, for sure, they have uh, some basal kinds of intelligence, but exactly how much is a, an empirical question for research. Interesting. Um, I'm going to jump to one from Kathleen about the planarians, because I was also, my mind was going to the planarians as well. How long do the two-headed planarians live how are their lives impacted by missing organs? Like, how do they handle waste? What is the, what is loss without the tail they evolved to have, et cetera? I yeah. was thinking about if they never really die, like, would the world ever just be overrun by planarians? <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, the world won't be overrun by planarians because lots of things eat them. So um, okay. there are lots of there's lots of fish and <laughs> fish and other things that that will eat planaria. Um, so no, uh, they, the thing is, as far as the waste, um, they don't excrete waste through the tail. So they have a little, they have a little tube in the middle of their body called the pharynx, which, which takes in food and, and outgo of the waste. Um, they, in fact, uh, the two headed animals tend to often have two pharynxes as well. So they're fine on that, uh, on that front. They can live, they can live basically forever. The only problem is the two heads often disagree about which way they're supposed to go. And so feeding is not trivial for them because as soon as one head tries to feed in a particular way, the other head just decides, you know what, I'm going to go somewhere else. And, and they have, they have kind of trouble. But if you, if you really, if you really, you know, help them out to eat, they can live, they can live forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there, I have one question I'm going to say for the last, but uh, one more, you mentioned emergence early on. Can you explain what emergence is? Yeah, um, emergence is uh, this idea that certain kinds of very simple behaviors when performed in large numbers at the same time give rise to surprising novel outcomes. So for example, uh, there, are, there are things where um, very, very simple rules, like, like let's say ant, ant behavior, right? Each individual ant carries out a fairly, fairly uh, a simple set of behaviors that it knows how to do. But when there's a million and a half ants, 
you find out that actually you have this amazing super organism that that uh, knows how to build um you know build a build an anthill and keep their numbers in appropriate uh, uh, ratios and go out and find food and come back and 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 make decisions about where they're going to go next uh, you know into when the when the colony splits and things like that uh, all of that is emergent in the sense that no individual ant knows how to do any of that. It's the collective. Mm -hmm. Another way to think about it is um, traffic jams are emergent. They're not a problem of the combustion engine. They're not a problem of any individual car. There's no, there's no traffic jam, uh, a defect to be found in any car. It's, right? The traffic mm -hmm. jam is, is, a, is, a, is a system level phenomenon that emerges when lots of cars perform certain behaviors. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the point of, of uh, mm -hmm. emergence. Okay, um, one more, because I think we have time. Uh, my parents contributed the DNA that made my hardware. How did they pass along their morphogenic information since I do look like both of them? Yeah, so what happens is, I mean, uh, the fact is that uh, most of the time, acorns make oak trees and fish eggs make fish. And the way that works is that what evolution has done is it has, um, really uh, so, so, sort of um, uh, re really refined every genome to create an electrical and, and chemical and biomechanical set of circuits that by default produce a certain kind of outcome. Think about, think about um, getting uh, the instructions for a calculator, right? You, you follow the instructions, you, the instructions only talk about the hardware. They don't talk about the laws of computation. They don't talk about what sines and cosines are. They don't talk about the laws of um, you know, arithmetic, nothing. They just, they just talk about what the parts are. So you build this calculator, you turn it on, right? So the juice first comes on and, it, and, and on the little LCD, it says zero. That is an incredibly reliable, um, uh, default outcome that that this machine is going to uh, perform because the 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 recipe for making it the 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 materials the, just the right transistors just the right the chips all of that stuff has been uh, has been really refined right so it's very reliable and it's going to be a particular outcome now as it happens you you might find out by by not by rewiring it but actually by giving it stimuli inputs you might find out that wow this thing's actually capable of a lot more. It, it actually knows how to do a lot more things than just say zero, but by default, it will very reliably give you that number. So that's, so that's the idea. The, the, the genomes combine to make a, a, a machine that all other things being equal knows how to, how to assemble a set, of, uh, a, a, a set of physical events that give rise to something that looks like a fish or like frog or, or like us or whatever, but, mm -hmm. but, it, but it is actually able to do a lot more than that. So it, it, that it, it actually kind of relates to the very first question in a way, right? I mean, yep. it kind of it kind of came full circle on that. Absolutely. Um, thank you. So so there's one I wanted to end on this one because it's kind of a fun one, and I'm I'm interested in it too. Is what science fiction books would you recommend if you read science fiction? That's a bit of an uh, assumption, right? Yeah. Well, I I, I certainly read uh, read it a lot uh, when when I was younger and had more time to uh, to read for fun. Um, I think a couple of my favorites. Uh, so so there's a Polish writer, um, Stanislaw Lem, L E M. So I think he has some uh, some some really interesting stuff, um, and uh, you know I like I like all the old classics. You know Bradbury, Asimov. Those are the things. Uh, yeah. Vogt, you know Van Vogt. Those those are the things the things mm -hmm. I was I was raised on. Yeah, I just picked up Octavia Butler, and I was reading her short stories on on a flight recently. Um, so this is great. We've got a great comment about it. totally mind blowing. Thanks for sharing. I'll be. <laughs> um, so, so that's great. And I just want to say, you know, thank you uh, so much for, for your time again. Um, so we're much. out of time now, um, but for making yourself available. And for those of you who are celebrating reunions this May and June, please check out the programming and registration. Amy will post that link in the chat now. Mike has agreed to appear again at reunions, um, although virtually on June 4th. So if you're a member of that cohort, please, please do check that out. Our next What Matters to Me and Why event will take place April 19th at 5.30 p.m. with Sarah Lewis talking about the wondrous world of fireflies. So with one final thanks to, to Mike, really appreciate it. I'd like to thank all of our attendees for joining us. Be well, and we hope that you can join us at another program in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye.